Hey everybody, welcome to Hit Rewind. This episode discussing three independent horror films from 1988. I'm your host, Michael, and Kersey's on the other side. How's it going? And this is, we're doing three instead of two, which is why this took a little bit longer. Uh, so apologies, we're going to kind of get back to the regular scheduled program, I think, after this. Yeah, well, I mean, well, three, I think, is a good fit. I mean, that's what we attended last time, too. It, but it turns out Prom Night 4 sucked dick, so <laughs> yeah. like talking about Well, no, I, I mean, like, I mean, like we'll, we'll get back into the habit of, like, trying to do it every other week. Oh, like, yeah. Well, to like be fair, I had to pick up so many shifts last week, so I've been behind on everything. Oh, okay. Um, Wait also, a minute, hold on. Did you, are you saying, I just want to have this on record, uh, so everyone knows, are you saying that I finished the movies before you this You time? did, for the first time. <laughs> You finished. Oh. I kept forgetting about Lady in White. Oh, I just yeah. kept forgetting. I'm, I'll say this. Also, for some reason, out of nowhere, I started watching a ton of old war and uh, westerns. I don't know. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. I don't know. It's a whole genre I really haven't explored. <clears throat> so, uh, I'm losing my voice. It's getting kind of late. Mm, uh, mm. Uh, <laughs> so, we're going to start off with Lady in White, Frank Lelouch's highly underrated, horribly misunderstood by audiences. But praised by critics, I think I know why now. I've never seen it before. Have you ever seen this before? I have not. I think I know why people weren't receptive to this, besides the fact that it was barely released. It's a fantasy. It's all a dream, sort of. I mean, he's telling a, uh, it's like folklore, a fantasy tale. So that's why a lot of the special effects in, in the places where they filmed are unreal they're just so dreamlike and and it's just it's supposed to kind of disconnect you from normal horror movies in our world and i think a lot of people didn't get that yeah i saw it more as like we're we're seeing it from the perspective of a child so like the the visuals are not going to be like these big uh special effects that we would be accustomed to even at the time period we're, we're looking through a child's eyes. Yeah, but I also think some of them were purposely made this way. This did not have like a, a, bar a bottom of a barrel budget. This had $5 million in 1988 for a, a horror film. That's actually decent. I think the special effects look that way intentionally. I mean, him running through the forest, I believe, is a set and, and, and not a real woods. So it's supposed to have like an old grim fairy tale kind of feel to it. I mean, I would hope it's a set. I mean, like running around in the woods at night, that's an yeah. <laughs> invitation to break your legs. So. <laughs> um, released by New Century Vista, but they were going out of business at the time, so they sold it to Samuel Golden Company, so that's why it was barely released. Um, I, I really enjoyed this film. I, I thought it was a wonderful... It was a horror movie that could be watched by everybody. Yeah, I would definitely say that. I think one of the things that threw me at first is obviously the time period. There's going to be some end bombs, which I didn't expect because I didn't really understand that it was a time period movie first. And then I was like, ah, are they going to? Are they not going to mention anything about it? Or are they just kind of using you know this for flavor to the movie? But it actually does come into play um, in a way that is really respectful. But uh, at least I think um, so. I, I'm really glad that um, they really use the time period effectively. Yeah, the, sadly the director only ever did one other movie after this. It was a TV miniseries called Creature. Um, did one movie before this called uh, Speak No Evil, I think. I, it's it's in my, uh, I think it's Speak No Evil. It's in our uh, voodoo. We're going to watch it <laughs> for some trashy Sounds films. Sounds familiar. Yeah. Someday we'll watch it. Um, I forgot my train of thought there. But I think it's kind of a shame because I think he had a really solid concept and a style. It just, for some reason, it just didn't take off. And it's always, I see that every once in a while, like a horror movie director that has like one or two films to their credit and it just never went back there again. Yeah, like you said, I, I do think that uh, a lot of the movie is very dreamlike. And I think that if you're not really primed for that, it does, it, it kind of drags a little bit in the first part, especially you're not exactly sure if what you're seeing is real. Yeah. Um, we, we, should, we should probably ex explain that the, the basic gist of the movie is that uh, a child is sort of being bullied at school and they sort of lock him inside of a closet. And while he's in the closet, he witnesses a murder and that there, someone hides something in the room. And then when he leaves, he finds out that that actually didn't happen at that time. Like, um, there was no one in the room. There was no evidence that anyone was ever in that room. But he goes back and finds out that the locket is there. But this is something that happened, like, years ago. 
Yeah. Something that so it 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 starts out really bizarre and it just kind of keeps going. Yeah, and it's it's more of a mystery movie I would think than anything else like a supernatural murder mystery, but there's also a kind of a like Stephen King, if you're into Stephen King stuff like it and stuff like that, of course, this is much more laid back in what is, you know, the scary stuff. But I think it really fits in well. There's a whole wave of 80s horror movies that were kind of like retro, like going back to a time period when someone was younger. And I really appreciate that. Yeah, I also like uh, the commentary that it kind of has about um, the, the murderers kind of being blamed on this innocent black man. Uh, and that is kind of a key point of the movie uh, that also turns up later that like the, the the real horror of what's happening is actually inside of the character's house. This is a family member that actually did this. Yeah, well also and there's so, the horror of uh, uh, spoilers here of what happens to him when he's yeah, sorry, let out. I mean, that was the fucking hardest part to take, I think. When he was let out? When he was let out, he's in the car. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah and yes. that was traumatizing. Uh, just like after all that, no one cared, and, and, and still that happened. I was like, oh, this is fucked. Yeah. This is based on apparently a real urban legend. A real urban legend? Eh, that's a weird, <laughs> weird words there. Uh, in New York about a lady in white who's constantly in search for her daughter. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Isn't that kind of like the La Lorena, I want to say? Uh, I think it's a Mexican folklore. Oh, you know, I haven't seen that. I don't know. Oh, okay, yeah, um, but uh, it's kind of yeah, kind of the same. Yeah, uh, not yeah, much a lot of stories end up being repeated over time. I didn't, I didn't realize until late in my life that Hamlet is actually was not created by Shakespeare. If he ripped that one off. Wow, so, I didn't know that who either. Knows where, who knows where these stories come? From? <laughs> um, I the whole movie's basically on Lucas Haas' shoulder, and I think he does an admirable job for a child actor. Yeah, uh, I mean, he's not the best but for a child actor he's definitely serviceable and luckily he has there's some other fantastic performances that really elevate the movie yeah and, and of course this is only his second film he had done witness for three years earlier i think and then uh i think he retired for a while like while he did school and then came back as an adult and has done a great job I also want to give a special shout out to uh, the sort of the, the actual killer of, in the movie who I think I believe turns out to be his uncle. Yeah. Uh, that turn when he realizes that the kid knows that it's him. <laughs> That's fucking and, insane, like, right? He, he just turns into like a wild animal. It was so <laughs> bizarre. It was horrifying, <laughs> but also hilarious. I, I actually said to myself, I go, is he Pennywise? Because that switch yeah. was so big. <laughs> Yeah, he, uh, it kind of became Cujo for a second, where he's in the car locking the door. Yeah, he, he just goes, and then dives down to the ground. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, another movie with wacko performances, and I think actually, be patient with the second one, American Gothic, because <clears throat> the first, I would say, 15, 20 minutes have every single shred of, oh, this is shit. This is some low rent Canadian shit. And then there's a turn, and a bigger turn, and it gets crazier and crazier, and I fucking loved it. Yeah, it's one of the where it's like, oh, I know exactly what's going to happen. And then very, almost uh, almost immediately when you have that thought, it just goes in the other direction. Like, oh, okay. Well, it's kind of, then it's coming, and it's going to kind of be like this, I bet. And then, nope, not going that direction. They're going to do something bizarre that you've never seen. Yeah, it's... <laughs> um, so it's just like one of these generic like oh we're trapped in this place uh, the, here it's just a, a, one of the islands off of like uh, isn't it like British Columbia am I wrong I think so yeah, yeah. I don't remember. And they're, they're, they're out just for a little plane ride or whatever and, and something goes wrong with the plane they land on this little island and <laughs> this is super religious bumpkin family with their like, well, it seems like a bunch of inbred doofuses as their children and solely the unraveling of the family and how they decided to take care of him. But I think the most disturbing thing is the daughter relationship, especially oh, with her for sure. <laughs> baby. But we're also dealing with trauma, uh, PTSD, um, yes. with the loss of uh, the main character's child. And it was one of these literally just, it, it's hard. It's just like, it's, mm. I, it's, I don't know why I'm having trouble uh, talking about this, but it's just like, she just looks away for a sec. I think this is I, what I'm dealing with is the fact of why I'm afraid to have children. 
why I was always yeah, afraid of children. Definitely, it definitely just like strikes at that uh, the the heart of what parents fear the most. Yeah, it's like uh, when I, I avert my gaze for a fraction of a second and something goes wrong. Yeah, I mean, I imagine if I ever had children, I'd be this, the fucking asshole who forgets he put the the thing up on on top of the car, you know, and then takes off and then or something like that. And I, every time that happened, it just like made my whole insides just clench. Because I've lived in that fear forever that if I ever had a child that I would do something like that. And that's why I don't have kids. Mm-hmm. Also, extremely unfuckable. <laughs> Sorry, I had to lighten it. It got a little dark there for a second. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. But, I mean, considering the con- what's in this movie, I mean, where, where else can we go but dark? Yeah. Um... I, I just don't have kids because I am just, like, too self-obsessed. Like, I can't imagine <laughs> loving something else more than me, you know? Fucked up. <laughs> Except movies. Uh, movies will always come. Yeah, yeah. Um, so in this, we have Rod Steiger. I think Rod Steiger was... Uh, do you know who Rod Steiger is at all? Uh, is he the ghastly-looking fellow? He's the dad, but I was just saying in general as an actor. There was a point where he was... Oh, a, you're saying the, the, the older one? or the, the Yeah, the dad. Brother? Yeah, the, the older dad. Uh, he was a big star for about 10 years and disappeared around 1981 because he developed agoraphobia. And critically acclaimed, very difficult to deal with. Oh, I'm thinking of arachnophobia. Never mind. I've never seen agoraphobia. Oh, uh, no, he just he was afraid of going outside, so he would just stay in his house for years on end. And finally, someone convinced him to do this film, and this is his big like comeback after eight years, and it's a hell of a performance. He goes big. Yeah. <laughs> well, with with a family like that, how can you not be big? Really, actually, everybody on the the demented family side is doing a, a great job chewing the scenery. I, it's it's the other ones that are so generic that you don't yes. really care that much, except for the main character. Hmm. I think on the side of the redneck family, I, I think the the bigger one. I think that was just one too many. <laughs> like, I was kind of, I was digging the family vibe, the creepy daughter, the the weird son, and then they had like the brute, and I was like, okay, that's that's a little too much. Yeah, they had the squinty. <laughs> Michael J. Pollard's always known for making. If you've ever seen Michael J. Pollard act, he's always doing this weird squinty kind of, you know, talking out the side of his mouth, kind of weirdness. <laughs> um, but I, I I really like the turn spoilers again uh, when she decides. <laughs> Not only is she going to kill the whole family, but then she's going to kind of take it over. <laughs> it reminded me of the end. Do you remember the movie we did like two years ago called Tourist Trap? Yes. That that feels like the same kind of ending. Actually, the uh, setup is kind of the same too, if you think about it. Their their car breaks down in that movie and they end up in the middle of nowhere. Cut off. They're playing. Yeah. Yeah. Playing kind of. So. Yeah, and then and then they were the crazy redneck or whatever, but that one has telekinetic powers. And then watching slowly as the main character snaps, and then she becomes just as you know wild and out <laughs> as the rest of the family. Yeah. So the, the the basic journey you go on when you start this movie is that the lady who has a dark past, which we don't know about just yet, is getting out of the mental asylum, and then they're like. Oh, well, we're going to go on a vacation and everything's going to be fine. And you're like, okay, I've seen this movie. She's going to go crazy. She's going to kill people. And then you get there to their destination, which is not the actual destination. They have to stop, make a stop. And um, then the, a family comes in. They're like, oh, okay, so it's going to be this redneck family that's going to kill this, th- these guys. And to some extent, that is true. But then the final twist comes in, or maybe not even the final twist, is that the lady who was at the mental asylum decides to kind of like stay with the family. Yeah. And you just like go about your day with her now as a member of the family. And like, what the fuck is going on? Like, what? <laughs> and then, and then the turn happens where she kills them. Like, okay, I, you, that, that was the weirdest turn of events I've ever seen. It was a weird way to go to get to this. Yeah, and then, oh, can I say, when they, I... Look, I knew they were murdering people, but when they showed like their little playroom filled with all the dead bodies, that was some Texas Chainsaw Massacre shit. Cause that was that fucked was some up. Shit. <laughs> this, I don't know if we've mentioned this. This movie's weird, y'all. Yeah, it's I really weird. <laughs> um, our third and final film is, I think, the best of the bunch, and sadly, the yes. one that's the hardest to find. We found it on YouTube, just like the other movies, so you get it there, but. 
Um, it's if, very. If this, if this one goes away off YouTube, I don't know where the hell you're gonna find. Yeah, it. it it was released 21 years ago on DVD, went out of print, and it's just it's so expensive to get right now. It's ridiculous. I hope somebody, some independent company, puts it out on Blu-ray and restores it. This is so much different than any other horror film that I think I have ever seen, especially during this era when everything was kind of trying to be a Freddy copy or a Texas Chainsaw Massacre copy or, or uh, I don't know, this is a psychological thriller, but so much it's, more. It's, it's similar to Psycho. Um, yeah, at the closest, yeah. Yeah, that would be the that would be the closest connection I could make. But yeah, it, it is a bizarre, nuts, out there concept that actually, if I think about it, I I think a lot about the movie Dog Tooth when I was watching it. I haven't seen that um, one. Okay, so the the concept of Dog Tooth is that a father is basically keeping his family hostage inside of the house and is uh, brainwashing them so that way they can't really mix into the rest of society, so they kind of just stay home. <laughs> Oh, it's, okay. It's, it's it's really weird, um, and it, I kind of got the same vibe because the the father of this family is so weird. I don't know what he's doing to his kids. Yeah. So he, the the whole movie is he's introducing his children to this medical dummy. You know, it, it's the kind that uh, uh, you can see all the organs on it. Um, you know, you've seen him in doctor's offices or science class where it kind yeah, of shows the plastic kind, not real. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of thing. Uh, just the guts, just hanging out, tongue just sticking out of the mouth. It's all, it's, yeah, it's, it's friend Gary. He, he, he died and he decided to donate his body to science. <laughs> um, but he's just showing them, like, you know, this character named Pin. And he's trying to teach him about sex. Yeah, wow, they really do have a weird relationship with this. I can't remember why, because the daughter, the daughter uh, was uh, getting older and she was starting to date boys and he used that to teach them. No, no, it was when they were kids. Yeah. So this is the one I saw about six months ago, so I forgot some of it. I should have watched it again. Yeah, so uh, allow me to okay. take the reins. So um, basically he uses the dummy. He, he like throws his voice and like has the dog talk to the kids. And so like whenever there's a subject that might be uncomfortable, he kind of uses the doll as sort of a, a, a mediator. Um, or just you know, or just generally for, to answer questions about the human body, uh, which would make sense. Yeah, well, I think but it's easier then, for both sides, honestly. Yeah, but then it starts to get creepy. Uh, the kids start to get older, and they start learning about sex, and in one instance, <laughs> I can't believe I'm about to say this, uh, the, the nurse or their mother, I'm not sure <laughs> who is who, uh, she decides to have sex with the doll, and the kids are watching it. Oh. Like they're, they're hiding in the room and they just happen to see it they're like what the hell is going on so they ask their dad what just happened and then the dad uses the doll to explain what sex is and they're like okay now we've crossed in the territory of like psychopath and i don't know where this is gonna go <laughs> so yeah that's how it basically it starts he's using the doll as a way to communicate with his kids on subjects he might be too uncomfortable to talk about himself but um the kids sort of start to rely on the doll as a way to understand the world because their father's just not talking to them. Right. Like anytime they want to talk to him, he's like, let's get pinned. He'll say it. He'll talk to you. He'll talk to you through this. So uh, once the father dies, nobody is speaking through pin anymore. So they keep trying to talk to him as if someday he'll just talk to them. And it's the, the son that starts to do it. He starts throwing his voice, but he's not realizing that he's doing it. And he thinks the doll is alive. And uh, yeah, it kind of just goes from there. Well, I think I think what's great is for a while there, you really don't know. The, the, yeah, there's definitely ambiguity. Yeah, the director does this great trick, especially when the, the parents get killed and they have it in the back seat. And is that thing moving? Is that? It? But it's basically just distracting. But is it? <laughs> you know, like you're like, mm, I'm not. Yeah, one is, is it shifting? Is it shifting around because the car is moving? Because he's driving kind of erratically. Or is it actually real? You don't know. Yeah, and, and watching, I think David Hewlett, uh, our main character, his performance is absolutely phenomenal. He's one of my favorites. He's so uh, good. He, he's a Canadian actor who did uh, uh, Scanners 2, which I really enjoy, but he also oh, yeah. did, um, he was on Stargate Atlantis for years. He did a movie called Cube, which uh, is fantastic. Um, oh, that's the one where there's like every room is like a different sort of thing. right, and it keeps shifting yes. around. You're trying to find your way out. He's in a whole. Uh, he's just in a bunch of movies, uh, like sci-fi and horror. It's kind of like his thing. If you look up his IMDb, you're like, I saw that. I saw that. I saw that. I saw that. <laughs> um, 
But I think his performance is phenomenal. But watching him slowly crack and watching the desperation on his sister, Cynthia Preston, she's fine. I don't think she's anywhere nearly as good as, as David Hewlett is, but she's fine. Um, well, she's also playing a very normal person. That's true. Comparison. That's true. So uh, and also, compare. she's the one who's kind of kept in. So she's more subdued, I think, because she's trapped. He does everything he can to keep the three of them together, even though she keeps trying to rationalize with him. She keeps trying to have relationships outside of uh, the family. And I just thought it was a very clever, well-done, low-key kind of psychological thriller where it's really based around the characters and not set pieces and special effects and, and blood. Yeah, if you want to know the special effects of, like, what the doll looks like when it's talking is literally just a close-up of a plastic doll with the creepy voice in the background. Yeah. Like there, there's, there's nothing spectacular, fantastical about this. It is very stripped to the bones and is very focused on the family dynamic. And yeah. I think that it really, it really works because the, the daughter who is very normal, it makes sense because she was from very young age was the more rebellious one. She was one who was more curious about what's going on out there. Um, more curious about her own body and the, the brother was just like so enthralled with the doll who was you know as I said before just a conduit for his father so he just has like this weird obsession yeah the, what um, the movie's ultimately about that is how obsession and delusion can just completely crack you mentally yeah and then this end up I think it was the, the father wanted to get rid of the doll I believe because yeah. he was so worried about his kids and what he had done uh, I think he started realizing, like, okay, I think I took this a little too far. I got to get this thing out of here. But that's when the car crash happens. Yeah. And like, okay, so is it because the doll literally came alive and is doing that? <laughs> yeah, that's one of the greatest mysteries. And then there's a switch. And this time I'm not going to spoil it. There's this thing at the end that happens that is just fucking poetic and crazy, but <laughs> bold as hell. I loved it. Go for it. Yeah, explain it if you want to. Oh, no, no, no. I want to leave this one. I want to leave this one. Okay, this, yeah. This was a big, great surprise. But, um... The, yeah, the ending, let's just say, is, is, um, is uh, fantastic. Yeah. Uh, all three, very well done. Uh, Low-key, kind of like, you know, independent films. Great performances. I think that's what works best, is if you don't really have the budget, you better put it into the performances and the characters. Yeah. Keep it simple. Don't try to do something that you, that you can't, that you know you can't pull off. Yeah. Um, so that is it for this. This time, uh, sorry, hold on. I, I'm getting tired of combining two sentences. Ooh. That is it for this episode. Next episode, we'll be combining three in, outside of the horror film genre. We're really kind of going to the thriller side. Um, we have Shoot to Kill, I think one of the best cop thrillers, but is it also a serial killer movie? Mm -hmm. um, great action uh, set pieces. And uh, Jack's Back with James Spader, which hypothetically presents could... Jack the Ripper come back a hundred years later. Um, and I can't remember what the third film is. My brain hurts. Do you remember what the third film was? No. no You're right. on your own, kid. We'll figure, we'll figure it out. <laughs> You'll find out as soon as we do in the next episode. <laughs> All right, so <laughs> check us out on Facebook and podcast hosts under Hit Rewind. <laughs> I really don't think I'm ever going back to Twitter. I just don't. <laughs> I, I left a while ago. It's psychotic. It's just psychotic, dude. It's unnecessary. Yeah, and just every day I get another reason not to do it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I've never had a Twitter account, and I've never felt the need to. I just so. feel like everybody argues all day long. Oh, it's horrible. Yeah, I, I go yeah. over there to talk about movies, but then we find ourselves arguing about movies, and somehow people are still obsessed with Zack Snyder, and they think he's a god. Oh. I, I, I worship no filmmaker. There's no filmmaker that's flawless. We love certain directors and actors, but they've all made some shit. <laughs> I mean, okay, I have one that's flawless, Denny Villeneuve. And I, you can't say shit about him to me. That's true. Okay, well, you're right. Okay. But eventually <laughs> no, he I'm will fail right. us. I just know it. <laughs> Everybody oh, does. I know. I, I fear every movie, that, every every movie that comes out that he does, I'm like, oh, fuck, is this going to be the one? Yeah. But I know it's going to happen. Um, God, yeah, you know what? I think I still think my favorite one of his, to go off on a segue real quick, is Prisoners. I just fucking love Prisoners it's so much. It's so good, yeah. yeah. I, I, don't, I, can't, I can't pick a favorite of mine, but everyone is watchable. Yeah. It is, like, rewatchable, I mean. All right, so that's the next episode, uh, and we'll see you later. Or hear you later. Whatever, you know what I mean. <laughs> Bye! You'll hear us later. I'll pop that. my eyeball and I'll throw it at you. That's why I'll see you. <laughs> Ew.